Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Fee Development for Myopia Management. We have our special guest with us this morning, Dr. Nick Despotitis. Um, I'm very excited to have you all here today. Um, I know it's a Sunday morning. We appreciate you um, getting up and sharing your Sunday morning with us. I know it's very early for some of you out on the West Coast. Um, I really hope that um, everybody has their, their caffeine if you're a coffee drinker. Um, <clears throat> because you're going to need to be on your game to catch everything Dr. Despotitis has. He's got just a, a ton of great information. Um, so we have, this is COPE approved. Um, you need to stay on the webinar the whole time this morning um, in order to get credit for that. We will be recording the webinar. And if you watch the recording, that's fantastic, but you will not get COPE credit for just watching the recording. You need to be um, here on the live session. Um, also, we didn't have time for questions at the end of our last webinar, and so Dr. D has agreed to kind of answer some of those questions here live this morning. I think he has two questions to answer for us. Um, we will stick around after his talk. We have um, a few more things to share with you at the end, um, but yeah, I think uh, we've got more people coming in here now. Um, Wow, we've got we've got some good attendance. So this is wonderful. I think without further ado, I am going to go ahead and um, get Dr. Despotitis going here. Take it away. Thanks so much, Cheryl. And before I start, I really I want everyone to applaud for for <clears throat> Cheryl Chapman. She is the president of the American Academy of Orthokeratology and Myopia Control. It's got to be about 7 a.m. where she is right now, and she gets up. This job is totally volunteer, it's totally selfless. And she, as someone who benefits from her leadership, I wanna tell you firsthand, all due honesty, she is totally committed to helping all of us be better clinicians. So Cheryl, I just wanted to take a moment since I had the stage to really uh, thank you once again. Thank you, Nick. Um, just a reminder to all of our participants, if you have um, questions, please put them in the Q&A rather than the chat. I will share some links with you in the chat today, um, but put your questions in the Q&A. That's a little bit better for us to kind of keep track of them and make sure that we do get them answered. Um, if we don't answer them today, we will be answering them in um, our third webinar of this series. Great. All right, so let's let's get the party started. This is the number one question I get no matter where I lecture, no matter where I walk. People say, hey, Nick, how do I know how much to charge for ortho K, for atropine? And through the years, especially after the pandemic, I've developed a really nice system that I'm going to review today. Uh, it's how do we develop fees in uh, private practice and myopia management? This is the second installment of a three-part webinar. Last week, I talked about how do you acquire quality referrals? And we taped that. I aired it last week. And I think it's worth your time to review exactly how I get patients to refer their friends to my office. That's how my myopia control practice has grown. No external advertising. Um, today, we're going to talk about what fees make sense for your practice. This is the key. It's not what fees make sense for myopia management or vision therapy or dry eye. It's what makes sense for your practice. And, and next week is the most exciting one, in my opinion, is how do you lead your staff? How do you lead your patients in such a way you're giving them a consistent experience? And that's next week. The two questions I wasn't able to answer, and I really wanted to answer them today, were actually good questions. The first one's my favorite, because I know this, this um, attendee has listened to me in the past. He or she know, gets it. She says, how do you address after our patient parent concerns without obsessing looking at your emails and texts? 100%. This has happened to me where I grew my practice to always be available, even though we have several doctors in our practice, to always be available. And it becomes not only an obsession, it becomes a burden. So there's two things I've done, is when, patient, when staff leaves, so for example, I've had one staff member, we'll talk about this next week, where she got her career going as a guidance counselor. I hire her because she knows my system so well, she's on her phone anyway, so she can do that on the weekends. We've also, investigated and have taken on virtual assistants. 
And I'll talk about that a little bit uh, next week when I talk about staff. Virtual assistant is someone who's not in my office. They could be abroad, they could be across the street. And I've done this, I've had two receptionists uh, part ways because of different reasons, maternity leave, uh, their husbands were um, stationed somewhere else in the country, but they can still access my email. And I have a long list of questions that are often asked. So this was a great question. And I hope I answered it in part today and I'll answer it more next week. The next question was, do you use a service for sending the pre and post visit education? And the answer is we use Nexus and now that's retiring. A lot of you use Weave. And basically Weave is a, a, a system where you can program email. So the email that gets programmed very easily is, hey, it was great seeing Johnny yesterday. Do you have any questions uh, and concerns? And they copy me, but it's automated. So that's really what my dog wants to get in here. I'm going to open the door. Excuse me right now. I'm going to just open my door. Come in. Sorry about that. This is with live seminars. So basically, there we automate we automate the the uh, the emails to go out. So those are the two main questions. But most of them are personalized, either by a virtual assistant or someone in the office. So let's talk about feed development. That's why everybody's here. So just a very quick background in case you don't know about our office. We've been in practice now a very long time since 1988, and we opened up cold. I personally became uh, focused on myopia management over two decades ago when my children became um, uh, nearsighted. We have one location with six ODs, and I think this is really important for people to absorb. I don't tell you this to impress you. I tell you this, that the profitability of one location can carry six full-time ODs. And that's what this, this section, this webinar is about. And the last thing is, is that we have a very good quality of life. All the partners, not all of us are partners yet. All partners see patients three days a week. And the rest of the day, we work on the practice, work with our family, work with, with our, ourselves, whatever we want. We've really converted our practice from a commodity-based office to a service-based office. And I'll get into that uh, very shortly. So this is kind of a very quick kind of org chart is uh, Barry and I started the practice 35 years ago. Ivan to the left, Ivan Lee, he joined the practice 20 years ago. So the three of us are full partners. Ivan, his primary responsibility is primary care and everything that goes along with it, medical optometry, et cetera. My focus of the practice is myopia management. My partner, Barry Tannen, vision therapy, and his son, Noah Tannen, is slowly integrating into the practice. We, he acts as a full partner, but continues to buy into our practice. So we have four partners, and then we have two residents that have chosen our office through SEO to study practice management and vision therapy. So we have four doctors plus two doctors that are training within us a total of six. So what's unique about our practice? It's multidisciplinary. We all enjoy practicing. You know, we have myopia management, we have vision therapy. Uh, Ivan did a residency in uh, medical optometry at Baskin Palmer. He enjoys medical optometry, and we're going to talk about why that's a thorn in my backside sometimes. And we do do glasses and contact lenses. We dropped all vision plans in 2001, all of them. So it's, it's been over 22 years. And I personally do not accept any health or medical plans. And that's been a transition, and I'll talk to you why. We don't sell soft contact lenses. We stopped doing that several years ago, not because we weren't making money, but it was an area of focus that was taking away, detracting from other areas of the practice. Uh, we have a standardized way of training staff and getting them to advance. And we, we've, we've had profitable growth over the past 30 years. It hasn't been linear. If I sat here and told you, yeah, we've been growing every year, you'd know I'd, I'm full of poops. But the actuality has been a very rocky ride. But I can honestly tell you, because of what I'm about to teach you, 
for the most part, over that 30 years, the trend has been upwards, which is not the case in many practices out there. And the last thing is very important. It's an exit strategy. Since Barry and I started to practice in 1988, we always talked about retirement. We were in our 20s, then in our 30s. So the exit strategy has changed. Initially, we were going to build up this huge conglomerate, and we were going to sell it in our 50s, retire, and live the good life. What we decided to do is make the good life within our practice. So now that we're in our 60s, we have no plans of selling our office. So even though we're solicited like many of you are every week, every month, we have no plans. The optometry office we've built furnishes our life in a wonderful way because we've learned to develop fees properly. So very quickly, this is the Ninja Turtle on the left-hand side. In case some of you don't know it, this is Barry squeezed between me and the person shaking the Ninja Turtle's hand is the mayor of our office. And this is, we were celebrating our four year anniversary at the time. At that time in 1992, most of our money was gained from glasses, a little bit from soft contacts, most of it was from glasses. So the purpose of the eye exam 30 years ago was basically in hopes of patients would stay in our office, get their contacts from our office, get their glasses from our office. And it worked. It worked very well. The busier we were, the more revenue we made, and we were pretty happy. But we knew there was a problem. When everything is commodity-based within your business, if commodities go elsewhere, this was before the internet, guys, then we are too vulnerable as a business. So of the, the past 30 years, we've learned to make our practice highly leveraged on our professional skills. It's a very safe place to be because there's only one Dr. Tannen, one Dr. Lee, one Dr. Noah, one Dr. D, right? As opposed to selling glasses and contacts. So why did we do that? So I grabbed this from the AMA wire, the American Medical Association wire, July 7th, 2023. It's an article, you should look it up. It says Medicare physician pay fell 26% since 2001. This is inflation adjustment. How did we get here? I love that title of the article. How did we get here? That's a damn good question. The, the reason we got there, in my opinion, is health professionals, we think about our patient first. We figure if we take very good care of our patients, insurance companies, employers would take care of us. And that has turned out, in my opinion, to be very false. So one of the reasons, even back then, we knew we were too leveraged on commodities and insurance-based uh, issues, com com uh, excuse me, on um, insurance acceptance, is that we were at the mercy of what insurance companies, vision plans paid us. It really didn't matter how good I was versus how good the person of my competitor or my colleague across the street. It really was determined by how much the vision plan or the health insurance reimbursed us. Another thing that had come up very slowly was internet contact lenses. And Hubble is owned by Procter & Gamble and their big business. So is 1-800-CONTACTS and the plethora of online uh, companies out there. And you may say, oh, you know, Hubble just got sued for a patient who had a corneal ulcer. Well, that was always going to happen. And it happens in my practice. Maybe it happens in your practice, God forbid. But the question is, is that is they, are they here to stay or not? In my opinion, online contact lenses, contacts as a commodity are here to stay. Do I agree with it? 100% no, but it's not up to me. There's also Warby Parker, who does a great job with online glasses. You know, my son is in, well, my oldest son is in his 30s, and he often visits Warby Parker and buys glasses from him, even though he could get them from his dad for free, right? Because it's cool to get glasses at Warby Parker. He goes into this booth and he takes pictures with his girlfriend, now his wife, and he's showing me all the different frames. When you order them online, you get four pairs, maybe five, and four of the five or three of the four go to charity. And if you don't like them, you can return them. This is not where I want to compete. I can compete. The patient is in my chair, but it's not my unique selling proposition. And the most insidious reason 
that we've decided to really focus on profitability is, you know this, we're getting audited when you accept insurances, whether you're doing a great job or not, you're getting audited, rejected claims, EOBs. You notice that the insurance companies are buying opticals or frame manufacturers are buying insurance companies. There's a consolidation of the industry that really one of my values, and, and we may talk about that next time, is autonomy. It was getting eaten up alive. I'd seen like the, the people who were reimbursing me were also owning the frames. And sometimes they opened their own uh, box stores in my community. So it was getting way too hairy. So I love myopia management for a number of reasons. You know, however, I really know why I'm doing it also. It fulfills my values in life. And one of them is autonomy. This is a slide I've showed since the pre-pandemic era is the doctor will see you now. You know, the story goes, and it's so true. My wife and I are going down the New Jersey Turnpike. I see this billboard with this boy taking care, taking a picture of his privates. And I asked my wife to roll down the window and take picture of it because even though this was probably 10 years ago, I knew the future was ahead of me, is insurance companies are gonna bypass physicians by hiring their own physicians and saying, listen, if you're part of our insurance company, you can call 24 seven, we'll have a doctor help you. And this is Oscar, I looked them up, they're still in business. Hi, we're Oscar, smart, simple health insurance. So telehealth became popular during the pandemic it wasn't in my wheelhouse, even if it got reimbursed, but I saw it that this is an arena I didn't want to compete in. I think this is here, the future. I don't know where you're listening from, but for me, I'm inundated with Amazon ads that I, if I'm an Amazon Prime member, I could become an Amazon Clinic member and I can um, call any time of the day to speak to a physician or a licensed health professional, and they could help me with erectile dysfunction, not my issue, but just saying, uh, COVID, UTI, birth control, and of course, uh, pink eye, conjunctivitis. So this is the future as I see it, guys. And this is why one of the main reasons I've decided to narrow my focus on myopia management, amongst many things. And that's why you, I feel, have to focus on it. Sure, we can do anything. We talked about this last week. We can do anything, but we can't do everything. So I think to be successful in any specialty, you need to know why you're focusing upon it. And that's what I call an inflection point. And this is a quote I got from a blog, the Learning a Day blog. And I love this quote. Navigating today's challenges with yesterday's assumptions, attempting to solve tomorrow's problem, problems with outdated mental model is like working with the wrong map. I feel if you're doing what you did prior to the pandemic, you're going down. You see the inflection point? It says business declines. In my opinion, only my opinion, if you haven't evolved post-pandemic, then your business is going to slowly decline no matter what you do. My practice doesn't look anything, my myopia control practice doesn't look anything like it did pre-pandemic. I'm going to talk about why. Uh, so why myopia management? It improved profitability. It reduced my dependence on in insurance if you choose to do it as well. Patient loyalty. Remember, I like, I like autonomy, but also like patient appreciation. And I know that I'm uniquely helping patients. And we talked about this a little bit last week. It's not just correcting their eyes or their vision. If you go into my LinkedIn, I'm very big now and posting all these videos with me and a patient. Why do I do this? I want you to appreciate the bond with families. Every parent is allowing me to interview their child for LinkedIn because of the bond I've developed through years, through the years. In my opinion, I spoke to many people. I've interviewed Kerry Gelb, who is the founder of the uh, Ortho K Academy, the American Academy of Orthokeratology and Myopia Management. We both feel that after this race to, to, for myopia management, it will remain a subspecialty. Now it's the buzz. 
last year or the year before, maybe it was dry eye, maybe next year or the year after it'll be presbyopia, who the heck knows? But the reason I feel it will remain, for the most part, a subspecialty, you need an orchestrated fee presentation like I'm going to go over today. You need to invest in equipment, in knowledge. You need to visit Vision by Design and other conferences like the Global Contact Lens Symposium, the Academy meetings, to get educated on how to do this properly. And there's a learning curve. There's a steep learning curve. It's not something you could squeeze in. And we talked about that a little bit last week, and I'll talk about it next week. You can't squeeze these patients in between checks. And the reason I think it's going to remain a subspecialty is it's not covered by insurance. So, Nick, that's great. You've talked for about 20 minutes. Five of those minutes are to your dog. How much do I charge? That's what I want to know, Nick. Come on. And I think there's two ways you approach this question is that it's either chair costs, looking at the costs within your business, within your practice, or market-driven. Market-driven is how, does, how much does Nick Despotitis charge? How much does Cheryl Chapman charge? How much does my colleague across the street charge? That's how much I charge. And the reason that mindset, I think, is wrong is it's kind of like insurance, right? We give for punctal plugs. When I used to insert punctal plugs, I used to insert four plugs and I would do uh, collagen plugs and then do the permanent plugs. I had a protocol. And all of a sudden, I noticed my reimbursements were reduced just out of the blue. Instead of, if I occluded four puncta, they would pay for one or two of them. Same thing when I did OCTs in my glaucoma treatment. When I would do optic ner nerve OCTs or optic nerve head tomographies, I used to get a bilateral reimbursement because I analyzed both optic nerves. Overnight, literally overnight, I get reimbursed as a bilateral fee instead of separately. So. The mindset is I have to charge what my colleague charges is misguided, in my opinion. So if you learn to follow my logic in the next few minutes, your fees, your, your, the smartness of you developing fees will resonate throughout your practice. So the quote I gave here, by calculating the cost involved with treating specialty care patients, you'll establish a foundation that will resonate throughout all the services you provide within your practice. In other words, it doesn't matter what specialty care, or by the way, any care, could be a glasses that you provide, as long as you know why you're charging what you're charging, it will resonate in everything you do. That's why I drop soft lenses. Yes, we were making a net profit of it, but it, it was pennies compared to the potential of other specialties we're providing in our office. And we're saying, listen, yeah, we could still sell soft contacts, not a lot of work, but it's still work. And it's a distraction, it's noise. So what do we do all of a sudden? We drop that and our net in the other aspect of our practices went up. And that's an inflection point. Do you have the courage to make the tough decisions? So what is chair cost? Chair cost is the dollar figure a provider must produce per hour to support their practice overhead. In other words, chair cost is how much does it cost you to turn on the lights and turn them off at the end of the day? You know that. A lot of us are very astute. We know if we make X number of dollars at the end of the day, we paid for everything, our staff, our vendors, our electricity and air conditioning and everything, our cleaner, but we didn't pay ourselves. That's chair cost. And people are saying that doesn't have much value these days. I say that's nonsense. If you're going to run a good, profitable practice, you have to know, you have to ask your CPA, your accountant, we have to calculate how much does it cost for me to see a patient per hour? And I've estimated this. It's, it's not uh, exact math, but from lecturing for a number of years and speaking to ODs, I think it's safe to say if you have two full-time ODs, it's probably about $250 an hour, give or take. If you're one full-time OD, it's $150. If you're a mom and pop practice and your spouse, he's the receptionist and you're the optometrist and it may be a little worn your practice, it may be closer to $100. If you have an elite one doctor practice and you have you know, beautiful environment with all the latest equipment, your chair costs may be up to $200 an hour. 
it's 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 that you at least look at this number and if you're three doctor practice it's around 350 and these are estimates it, it varies you know I, I practice in the tri-state area in New Jersey it may get, be different for someone who practices in the Midwest but it's still an extremely important number and it's being uh, criticized by a lot of uh, people because they said, ah, it's not as valuable anymore. You know, Nick, your chair course is high. My chair course is low because I'm practicing in the Midwest. No, a chair course is a number. Here's an article that I grabbed from Envision. Why chair course is less relevant in the era of managed care. Number one, chair cost implies a, implies a problem lies with the fees charged, not the way the doctor is managing his or her overhead. In other words, overstaffing. That's nonsense. How many of us out there are overstaffed? I, I, this is a virtual call. I know all of you are smirking. None of us are overstaffed at this, at this day and age. Number two, doctors often find themselves in a situation where they can't pass on operating costs in the form of higher prices to their patients because of managed care. So they're telling us in this article, you got to get smart and cut staff and cut costs because your income is fixed coming in. And do you see the flawed analysis with this? That is leverage, guys. You have to understand this is nonsense because managed care works on volume. The way you make up the reduced reimbursements you get from managed care or any health insurance like Medicare has gone down is by increased volume. There's no other way. And hoping that maybe some of the patients who come in for exams will get commodities like glasses or soft contacts from you. But as the competition grows outside of our offices for commodities, and as our fees are being reduced or even stagnated, next week we're going to talk about staff management, which I really have a good handle on. But I got to tell you, the cost of my staff has skyrocketed since the pandemic. So I either lose staff or I pay them what I feel is worth, not only monetarily, but many different ways that we'll discuss next week. And I got to raise my fees. But if I accept insurances and insurances are not increasing their fees, you could see why so many doctors at my age say, I've had it. I've, I've had it. I'm just going to sell, man. I'm going to work for someone. It makes sense because I'm squeezed for both ends. Staff, everything costs more, including the gas to go to the office food to put on my family's table. And then my fees are going down. They're not going up. So you could see why practitioners now are so willing to sell at, the, at this point or just get out. So let's get to the crooks of this talk is let's assume you're about a $200 an hour chair cost practice. You maybe a one person, nice, clean uh, office in tri-state area, maybe not Manhattan, tri-state area, and you spend, like I advocate, one hour for a consultation. We do this for everything, guys. We do it for vision therapy. We do it for dry eye, although we don't focus on dry. We need the patient to understand what the problem is and understand the therapy we're providing. For me, I can't do that in the exam chair, and I don't think you can do it. So we do, in our practice, in about a year, we do six 20-minute follow-up visits, you know, checks, if you will. Sometimes we do it over two years, but in our office, you know, other offices disagree. Maybe they fit the lens. They check them in six months. In our case, it doesn't work. And we're, we're going to talk about chair cost a lot. So in our office, if you follow my logic, it takes me about two hours to treat a patient in a year. And it takes me one hour to do the consultation. So I've invested three hours in every ortho K or myopia management patient. So I'm in the hole right now, about $600, no matter what I do. And then I have to pay for lenses. I don't have to pay for atropine drops. I have to pay for contacts. In our office, if you get multifocal, our program includes the first year or two, depending if your program's a year or two, of multifocals as well. So the cost is more than $400 for multifocals. Certainly for me, I've been doing ortho K for a long time. Sometimes it's less than $400 to fit a patient. Sometimes it's three times that amount. It's like $1,200. But the bare minimum for this example, we're going to go through several examples, is it cost this doctor, not me, $1,000 to service 
a, let's say, ortho K patient in a year. And that includes, and you haven't made any money. So now you have to decide, not your colleague, not insurance company, how much is it worth to you that you've devoted three, three, three hours to this patient plus costs and everything else. So it could be $1,500, it could be 2,000, it could be 3,000. Only you can answer that question, but you have to know the cost. I think what drowns most practitioners, that's why I started with that one question by that practitioner. He or she was seasoned. She says, Nick, how do you answer the plethora of questions that occur, text, emails over the weekend without obsessing? He or she got it because I found it doesn't matter the ethnicity of the patient, in my opinion. And we talked about this last week. Someone who's interested in myopia management is very analytical in nature. It's not everyone, but in my practice, it's got to be 90%, maybe 95. In other words, the parent who is interested in managing myopia with a contact lens as opposed to a standard contact lens or glasses is analytical. So what you're looking at now is what I call an insidious chair cost. So it's not in the six hours. This is constant email. So this student kept an, a chart, an Excel spreadsheet, and she was tracking her visual acuity in the morning and the evening. So on March 25th, she, her right eye vision on the upper left corner was 2050. But in the evening, I don't know what happened. She didn't measure it. On the 27th, okay, so excuse me, one day later, 27, it was 2040. In the evening, it was 2200. You get the picture. She's keeping her VA. I don't even know how she's measuring her visual acuity. I don't even know. Number two is this is a nightmare. The only saving grace for me, she wasn't doing monocular visual acuity. But I have students who do monocular visual acuity, AM and PM. And that's why I think this is going to remain a specialty, because in my, my um, experience, these are the patients who come seek my care for myopia management. And if you don't, this is what I was teaching last week, and I'm going to teach it next week. If you don't learn to address this with expediency and with patience and compassion, then your practice won't grow. You're like an orthodontic practice, an orthodontist that adjusting braces all day, but not getting new patients. That's why it's very dangerous to grow anything, any specialty practice, especially or, uh, ortho K, because if you're not careful, these patients will stay with you, the ones you enlisted in your program. But if you're not doing an amazing job, you're not going to grow. And if you don't grow, you're just adjusting lenses and braces and holding hands all day. I hope you get that point. So where most fail is we look at gross revenue. It's the wrong metric guy. Maybe it worked when I started 30 years ago. The higher my gross, the more money we made. I think I wasn't as astute as I was now. I was just looking at a gross number because when you open cold and you're making 50,000, 100,000, 400,000, it's not a lot, but certainly we're growing. But when you're a mature practice, if you're only looking at the top number, you think you're busier, you're enlisting more patients into your myopia management, maybe you're doing specialty contact lenses like sclerals, and your gross is going up, but your net is not. And that's why I feel it's such a specialty. So I give this podcast, uh, Dr. Chapman was on it. It's called Dare to be Different. I love it because I get to meet colleagues like Valerie Lamb, and I just interviewed her. I didn't even drop this episode. But I've never heard this quote, never heard it. It came straight from her. You don't have to feel that there is competition when you do a specialty. And I preach this, I embody this, but I never heard someone say it. And then I hear everybody in the audience right now saying, how can that be with my competitor doing ortho K across the street? And, you know, Another person bought another dry eye instrument, or there's a vision therapy doctor that's accepting insurance, and I don't. How can he or she say this? How can you say this, Nick? And it depends on the stages of care. So we both agreed when I was speaking with Valerie is that just because I do VT or I do ortho K doesn't necessarily mean 
It's how you do vision therapy or you do myopia management, right? It's called the same, but you and I know it's very different. And we all have a uniqueness to the way we provide care. So I've come up with this. I haven't seen it out there. I've come out with a dual way to look at how you should charge fees within your practice. The first is what stage of care do you provide? And I call it standard of care. Standard of care is you're doing a great job with myopia management. You, you have a topographer, you're, you're doing just a great fit. The child sees well, that's standard of care. But excellent care, you start going above a little bit, right? You do a consultation, you have some snacks, you kind of make the patient, you give the patient time. That's what we talked about last week. And then there's few of us that give first class care. And that's what I try, train the people who follow me is I'm built only one way, guys is first class care. When I used to remove a foreign body, I would remove it to the best of my ability, all the rust. I put a contact lens on, I treat the patient, and then I call them and call them until they said, Dr. D, I'm feeling fine. What frustrated me, it didn't matter because my partner Ivan would remove the rust ring, do as good of a job as me, probably better to be honest with you, and never call the patient. You know, just say, you know, you know, they call the emergency line. Who's better, me or Ivan? No, we're both very good. Ivan just fits the best ortho K lens I've ever seen in my life. But it's not, he's not built to hold their hands and give snacks. So if he's charging first class care and I'm charging standard of care, we're both gonna suffer. So let's go through this, Nick. What are you talking about? So standard of care is excellent fit, good vision, non-specific schedule. It's like many of you there. You guys get it. You have your topography. You work hard to get the child to see well, and you're done. I'll see you next year. That's standard of care. I'm not talking about someone who's sloppy. This is very respectable. It's someone who's done a very good job in fitting the lens. But that's one level of care. But then excellent care. I would say my middle partner, Dr. Noah, he's built for excellent care. He goes, you know, we have axial length. That's a little bit higher level of care, in my opinion. Uh, we have a separate consultation. Noah did a, a vision therapy residen residency. I did a vision ther therapy residency. What do we do in vision therapy? We give consultations. Ivan did a path residency. There's no consultation. You come back for a glaucoma workup. You know, that's it. So the thing is, we do consultations. We have a dedicated follow-up pro protocol. In other words, we, we want to see the patient every three months. They're here to see myopia management. Well, I can't see them every six months in the beginning. So we have a dedicated follow-up procedure. We discuss about lifestyle. It's built in me. Your smartphone, if you go on LinkedIn, you'll see that's all I talk about. Smartphone use, posture when their child is reading, are their feet on the floor? Is their back against it? Parents love this. Parents love it, but it takes time. It takes a different stage of care. I communicate continually in between patients. So that doctor who asked the question in the beginning of this webinar, how do you not go crazy? Well, another answer is charge appropriately. If you're answering emails with urgency, like I promote, and you're answering emails either through a virtual tech or live on the weekend, charge. You'll feel a lot better because your competitor across the street, no matter what they charge, if they're not doing that, you're competing on the wrong level, right? It's like Apple competing with Samsung. They both have really, really good phones. And there's a lot of argument like the Samsung is maybe a better phone than the iPhone, but it's the feeling that we have when we go into the Apple store or we own Apple products. So that's what I quote as, or call a stage of care, excellent care. And we're going to give examples very soon. So stay with me. I give snacks. And I mean, I give snacks, you know, doctors say, yeah, I open the drawer. The kid never takes a snack. I make a snack. My son taught me this when he was at the dentist, he went to a pediatric dentist and he'd come out with these little chintzy. It could have been floss for all I know. I don't know. And he said, dad, you know, make sure you don't give eye drops as a reward because the, this dentist stinks. This dentist gives the worst a toys that there is. So I learned when you open up my snack drawer and we're going to give this next week, we're going to talk about this. There's no way a kid doesn't want to take something out of that snack drawer. We give reports 
and I have a dedicated staff member, always have, once I grew, for excellent care. Got it? So standard of care, great fit. Excellent care is great fit, plus all these things. And then what I strive to deliver is first-class care. I do virtual parent conferences before the patient even walks in. They will refer to me, but they probably will refer to you too. They, you know, if you practice in New Jersey, it's word of mouth now. That's the difference between the pandemic, pre-pandemic, post-pandemic. When I started this, there was maybe five of us in New Jersey that did this well. Now I'm competing with ophthalmologists prescribing atropine like, like nothing, optometrists prescribing atropine like nothing. Every OD, as they should, prescribes multifocals. And now a lot of ODs are either dabbling or doing a great job in ortho K. So I had to up my game, right, guys? So they were referred to me and referred to maybe my colleague across the street, who's a very good OD. So I up my game. If you refer to me, I'm going to get and do a virtual call for 10, 15 minutes. And you're going to know that I care about your child more than anybody else. That's first class care. I don't talk about, I'm going to fit them. I use a Pentacam. I use a, an A scan and the, the, the bullseye pattern that I get is central and the axial length. I'm going to narrow the optic zone diameter. And so your child is optimized for my, none of that. I just want them to know that my office is different. And I think you should do the same if you want to deliver first class care. I place urgency and correspondence. So going back to that great first question, if I can't respond to this parent, I make sure someone does. I have a scribe in the room that makes sure my EMR is filled out properly. And whatever my recommendation is, it's transferred to the patient. The baton is passed very nicely. I have application and removal prizes we're going to talk about next year because that's another flexion point for your service is um, the INR class. I have discussion after every visit. Every visit. Every time a patient comes to see me, I sit them down and I talk with the mom. How are you doing? How's this? How's this? How's your dog? This is myopia progression. This is lack of myopia progression. Is your child going out, et cetera, et cetera. I correspond after each visit and that's using an automated program. It comes from my technician. It says, and we'll go over this next week, minimal wait times. This was something that was going nuts. I read the book, The E-Myth. We talked about it a little bit last week, E-Myth Revisited. They said, why can't doctors be on time every time? And I'm saying, damn right. I want to be on time every time. How could I have been on time every time when my practice was based on volume? High throughput was the only way I thought I could make a good living. So I switched my practice around to high quality and not quantity. I give seminars, which we talked about last time about virtual seminars, and I talked about in-person seminars and the type of seminars I give, and I create orchestrated memories, and it drives my staff crazy. But I've been doing this for 20 years, right? If you're just starting out, or even if you're not, you take pictures with your patients. I got this from VT. We've been doing this from the, the beginning of time, right, in vision therapy. They hold the diploma, you know, they graduate VT, and we take a picture together. And then they come in and sure enough, the child, all of a sudden, he or she is taller than me. She's an executive. She's a physician. She's an instructor. He's a hedge fund, whatever. And I've created orchestrated memories. So when people get on WeChat or Snapchat or Instagram or Facebook or on the soccer field or at church, they say, where did you go to get your child glasses or myopia control or ortho K, whatever they call it, they say, Dr. D. Why? Not because I fit this lens so well. It's because I deliver first-class care. So let's give examples. So write this down, get a piece of paper. Okay. So this fictitious, this fictitious office, it cost them a thousand dollars. This was the example I gave to provide myopia management the way you provide it, not the way I provide it. Okay. Because maybe you just see them. I remember I see them six times afterwards. I see them one day, one week, one month. I see them six times. Maybe you only see them twice. So $1,000. If you deliver standard of care, good fit, you have a topographer, you know how to use the topographer, it's, you use high quality lenses that are reproducible, I think it's reasonable that you may want to sample a fee at $2,000. I'm not suggesting it. 
I'm not saying that, but it makes sense to me. If you're charging for me, this is just my, if you're charging 1500, sell a damn pair of glasses. You know, it's too many visits, too many emails to do it. If you provide excellent care, you have a consultation, you are providing snacks, you're, you're making, you know, you're checking A scans and you're educating them on the A scan, then I think it's 2.5 times makes sense. That's a, and, and 3.5 for first class care. So if I, if I charge just $2,000 in this fictitious example, you can hear it in my voice. I'm losing money because even though I'm very good at fitting ortho K lenses, I've been doing it for 20 years plus, it's that I can't help myself. I'm saying, where did you go on vacation this year? Are you going outside? You haven't gone outside. Yeah, Dr. D, the mosquitoes, the crickets, it's too hot, the smog. I say, come with me. I bring the mom in. I say, hey, listen, we got to get this kid to play outside. I've sent you research on why daylight's so important. So you can hear the way I'm built. Ivan cares just as much. I am telling you, Ivan, my partner, is one of the best ODs I've ever had the privilege of knowing. But it's not in his DNA to BS. You may think it is BS. He thinks it's BS. I don't. I think it's great care to talk about the child's dog. Is the child taking speech instead of just math in class? This is how I'm built. I'm always built. So you could see I've devised an office that doesn't compete with anyone. It just makes sure that I'm getting reimbursed for my level of care, which is what I call first-class care. So let's give another example. Now this fictitious office is a mom and pop. Their, their, their carpet hasn't been updated maybe in 10, 20 years. It's like clean equipment, but old. You know, they have an older topography, you know, maybe they don't have an A scan or they may have an A scan, but they have an A scan that maybe is used or something that doesn't fit the bill. You get the picture. There's nothing wrong with this. It's a good optometric practice that basically hasn't invested in the environment and maybe technology. And they certainly don't like to, 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 uh, to spend a lot of time. So in this office, it makes sense that you charge 1600 instead of the other office that was 2000. The excellent care office, excuse me, if you have a mom and pop, but the spouse, he's always calling, seeing how you're doing, things like that, they may want to charge 2100 If this little mom and pop office with very uh, basic equipment is delivering first class care, snacks, knowing the patient by name when they walk in, calling the patient after each insertion removal class and every day until this child learns, that's first class care. So it wasn't their environment, their footprint that determined what they charge. Again, it's the level of care and their chair cost. You see how both are important? So if you're competing with me that has six, six uh, ODs and I have a 6,000 square foot office and I have every toy you could imagine, you need to compete in a different level. So that's why it's silly to do market-driven Fees. And I think that's why Dr. Lamb said that when you do specialty care, the competition is not price. It's the quality of care you provide, the level of service. Let's one last example to kind of close on this is in this fictional case is your 1500 to, to provide this care. Then I think you would charge something like 3,000, 3,500, 4,000, even though across the street, they may charge the person before is charges 1600, you're charging 3000. Well, you have more doctors, your physical plant, your chest course is higher. So it means you have a, you know, more overhead, you have nice office, you have nice floors, you have nice equipment, clean, you've painted, you've changed your decor, and you spend time. So that's why, in my opinion, if you're competing on price, you're going to lose, you could see how I could lose very easily. If I charge, everybody is charging, let's say, we're going to pick a number, 2,500, and Nick should charge 2,500, I'm going to go broke because I only have one way of practicing. And likewise, I think if you're one that just does the great fit, no snacks, no lifestyle discussion, and I do, even though I'm more expensive or my fees are higher, I'm probably going to win out. And the last thing I'd like to close on this is it's not enough to know the stage of care you provide. That's only the first part. Here 
is what I've always taught. And now it's more important than ever since the pandemic. That's why I said your practice has evolved is how difficult is this patient? What is the age of the patient? They started developing myopia. What is the degree of the myopia that developed with? Is parents, do parents have a history of myopia? So in other words, is the parental history is very important. If I'm talking to a parent and they're minus 10, 12, and I'm looking at their six-year-old in the chair who's minus one, two, three, I know no matter how good I am, I'm in for a ride. Corneal curvature, do they have flat case? Do they have very steep case? Patient sensitivity. Sometimes I do a consult. Remember, I put a lens on. If the patient's crying and the palm starts crying, I know that level goes up. If I put the lenses on the child's eye and they look like they have nothing in their eyes and this is the first time I've done this, I know what level to charge and how much time the family's gonna need for handholding. So let's clarify this with an example. It's huge, guys, it's huge. Let's say you have a minus one myo. One is 10 years old and one is six year old, right? They're minus ones. So if you're charging or your levels are based on just your stage of care, good, better, best, or minus ones get charged this, minus twos get charged this. So if you just have one global fee, you've lost. The Ks are the same in this patient. Amazing. Both have the same Ks, both uh, refraction, just different ages. The 10-year-old has no parental history of myopia. They were virtual during the pandemic. Mom, you've heard this over and over again. They started becoming uh, myopic right after the pandemic. The other case, the six-year-old, both parents, very high myopes. Mom's a minus six, dad's a minus 10. 10-year-old, mom and dad cooperative. Now you see why I'm doing this virtual call. Nothing I do is wasted energy because I know what the level, I know what my stage of care is, right? I only do one stage of care, but the level I know after the virtual call. Sometimes the parent is keeping me there on the virtual call and very nervous. I heard about infections. I heard my friend paid less. Are you going to fit CRT? Or are you going to fit VST or ability? I heard there's many different lenses. I have a lot of questions. And they're good questions. And I answer them. Remember, if I don't answer them, they're not going to refer friends and family. But the level goes up. So if they go to you and you're half my price, it doesn't matter. I still win. Do you see that, guys? Because that patient is not going to demand less of you because you're half the price. I learned that long ago. They're, they're, they're built just like I'm built. They're going to ask you more and more questions every time. They're going to ask you for that A scan every time. So if you were afraid not to charge the right amount, you lost. I won because they went to you. And if they come to me, I won because they paid fees that are consummate to the amount of time that's required. That's how the world works. Doesn't anybody understand this? If I bring my car to the mechanic, they have a grid and they say a brake uh, replacement for four brake takes this much time and this is how much it costs. But when you accept insurance, sometimes they get paid for two brakes as opposed to four. And they say, yes, nobody says that in the real world, only doctors. You have to charge according to what the case is gonna entail. So fees assessed are based on the stage of care and the complexity of care. So to close on this is the way I track this is how many consults am I going to allow in a month to make sure my practice is running properly? So in my office, I may allow five to 10 consults a week or 25 a month. You may do one consult a month, doesn't matter but make sure whatever consult gets filled is profitable. Otherwise you get frustrated. Like I used to when I did um, keratoconics, I have a handful of keratoconics that drive me nuts because for me, it was more of an intellectual challenge, a clinical challenge, but they've stayed on forever. Don't let that happen to you with myopia management. You have to set goals. Goal setting is I want one consult a month or five consults a month and you need to allow to schedule them because not only for the consultation, 
if you want that one consult, like everybody says, Nick, how do I grow my office? And we talked about that last week is you get one ortho K or myopia management patient. So incredibly happy. They can't help but telling other moms and dads at church, at the soccer field, on the internet, that you are the best doctor that they've ever been to. And how do you get called the best doctor since they don't know to read a topography, even though they think they do, is how much time you spend with them. So I'm going to give you a quiz, and we're going to close the C portion of this, is the quiz is, what changes are you willing to make to realize your goals? In other words, if you don't leave this webinar with making a decision to make a change, you're going to be lost. Tomorrow, Monday, when you go back, wherever you are in the world, you're going to lose. So one, I will fill an empty console slot with an exam. So this happens to me very often. I want five, 10 consults a week. Do you really think they're always filled and everyone who fills them converts? Absolutely not. A lot of times they're empty, but when they're empty, I have to make a decision. Do I fill it up with an exam or B, do I fill the empty slots with some emergencies and checks? I mean, it's empty. It hurts. It's one hour. I could put three exams in that empty slot. I could put a few checks, a few urgencies, emergencies, or I could leave it empty. C, do I leave it empty? The way I answer this is I leave it empty because that for me is pain. And it's also a barometer. Am I doing a good job? Am I doing what I taught you guys last week in marketing? If it's empty, the answer is no, I haven't been doing a good job marketing my services, my office services. When you fill up an empty slot, you've given up. You're defeated because now you haven't given yourself pain. The pain of having an empty slot, knowing I could put three exams there, but then you haven't learned. You haven't given yourself leverage to change. So in summary, Fee development bears down to the cost you've decided that it takes to run myopia management in your office. And then how are you going to deliver that care, good, better, best? And third, are you going to charge levels knowing the competitor next to you, across the street from you, may be less or more? I encourage you, the way I've grown is I've charged fees and I've made many mistakes that make sense for my office. And I don't look at the market. I look at my office. So thank you very much. Next week, I'll be talking about what I feel is the most important aspect of myopia management is getting your staff engaged and happy so they deliver this excellent first-class care. And how do you get your patients to get consistent first-class care? Because I'm not everywhere, right? I'm only with the patient 20 minutes at most. The all the other exposures through my staff, and I'll tell you how I do that next time. Thank you so much. Well, that was wonderful, Dr. D. Um, I know it's early in the morning, but I'll tell you what, that got me pretty energized. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, the CE portion is concluded now. I wanted to highlight just a few extra things. We did put in the um, chat box, uh, two different websites. One is for um, a special conference that we have for the AAOMC um, in September. It's called Vision by Design. Nick, did you want to talk about that a little bit? I do. You hear me. I'm, I'm chopping at the bit. You know, when I started a myopia management in 2000, uh, somewhere around there, 2001, I was lost. And if people like Carrie Herzberg and Cheryl Chapman um, didn't lead, I would still be lost. I, I would be where I am, but without vision by design, I would be just kind of learning through trial and error, speaking to colleagues. It's like this course where I learned a lot, you know, how to read a topography, bought my topographers, bought my A scans, bought all that stuff, which is the right one for me, which lens design to fit. But here's the intangible when you go to vision by design. It's very different than any meeting that I've ever been to is in the hallway and sitting next to me, I start talking with people and I'll say, hey, my name is Nick. I practice in New Jersey. And they'll say, hi, my name is Cheryl. I practice in wherever. And we will start talking about our practices and I will learn 
from the conversations I have among peers. It's very different than when I go to the academy. I go for the academy, maybe for cutting edge research in medical optometry, but no one talks to me unless I know you and it's in the hallways just saying hi or bye. Same thing with the AOA. It's more of a jovial atmosphere, but it's a totally different vibe. There is no other, I promise you, I have no vested interest. I'm not part of the academy other than just as an advisor. There is no other meeting than vision by design. I would not be where I am today, without a doubt, if I did not attend vision by design early on, it was called something different in 2001, all the way today. I've, I don't think I've ever missed a year. That's how important it is for me and my practice. Thank you. Um, I would also like to highlight um, something that Nick does that I think is especially valuable to the doctors who are on this um, call today. So I am talking now not as a representative of the AAOMC, but I'm talking as Dr. Cheryl Chapman. Um, I think it was 2017 or 2018, I attended a special workshop that Dr. D puts on. It's called Supercharge Your Practice. Um, and I would like to encourage all doctors who are trying to get their foot in the door with this and they're trying to navigate this. It's a lot to navigate by yourselves when you have you know, a busy practice and your other commitments outside of work. Um, if you want a playbook, that is very succinct um, and very much in line with your goals with what you want to do with incorporating this subspecialty i would say you know sign up for dr d's supercharge your practice i did put the link to that registration um, in the chat box as well um, and again i'm it's just i'm saying that just as as dr cheryl chapman um, not, uh, I have no financial vested interest in that. I just think that it is a really good way. If you've liked the content that Nick has delivered today, um, it's a really good way to get more of that uh, and to figure out how it fits into your specific practice. Um, Nick, we have a request. If you yes. could um, go back to the slide prior to the quiz page that you had. Yes. I think people just wanted to see that a little bit more. I yeah, also I ran out of time. Um, we, we're going to talk about this next week as well, because this is the fill rate and sign up rate. So with me, I'm a touchy feely guy, but I also know if you don't measure it, it won't happen. So every week we look at our fill rate and sign up rate. So fill rate is of the consults I've allotted for, let's say it's five. How many of them were filled? And as you could see, I'm blatantly honest, you know, in January, it's 80% of them. That's great. And February, 70%, not as great. And March, 86. So our fill rate, if we had, let's say, 158 available uh, consults, this is year to date. This is the end of the year. I fast forwarded or, or some uh, static or some number, 87 were filled. So marketing, really good, Nick. But my sign-up rate is dropping. It's now at 73%. That means at least 30%, almost 27% are not signing up, but have come for my consult, did the virtual, did the whole song and dance. So I know there's my system is somewhere broken because I know from experience my sign up rate should be upwards of 80%. In other words, if remember, if they came for the consult, they're myopic and they're a candidate. Otherwise, they wouldn't be there. That's the purpose of the virtual call, amongst other things. So this is huge. That's how I track my fill and conversion rate. And that's why I leave it empty at the end and find out why it's not filled. And then I check if they're converted or not. Yeah, that's a good point. You know, human nature drives us, right? Uh, yes. And yeah. So uh, we're four minutes after the hour. I think that um, unless you have any closing remarks, Nick, I just thank everybody for um, joining us this morning, sharing your Sunday morning with us. We have another webinar, our third in the series. And what, what's the date on that, Nick? It's next Sunday, whatever that date is. Uh, I don't know. I think it's July 30th. I think July 30th. Right. And yep. it's 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, and I'm going to tell you, this one was good. The last one is going to be the best because no matter where you are in the world, you have a staff and you have patients. And I've really worked hard to create systems on how to deal with both. 
and we will be having recordings of these webinars. Um, you will not get COPE credit if you only watch the recording though. So please do join us live next Sunday morning. Thank you all. Thank you, Thank you Cheryl. Thanks so much.